Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this afternoon's program, Heroes of the Holocaust, Priests and Nuns, presented by the Florida Holocaust Museum. My name is Jada Lugo, and I am the Associate Educator at the Florida Holocaust Museum, and I will be the moderator during this program. Your presenter today is Howard Kerner. Uh, Howard Kerner is a recently retired English professor who has spent the last 25 years researching unknown people who performed acts of kindness and nobility during the Holocaust. His latest project involves recently discovered facts about Anne Frank and her family. Howard's inspiring presentations can be heard at the Florida Holocaust Museum, USF, Eckerd College, churches, synagogues, and many civic organizations. He continues to create new programs that highlight noble people and the kindness and humanity. Uh, we also want to give a special thank you to Susan Nolan, artifact owner and continued supporter of the Florida Holocaust Museum for all of her help behind the scenes to make this program happen. And we will be taking questions throughout this presentation and we'll be getting to those questions at the end of the presentation by Howard. Um, just leave those questions um, on the YouTube comment section below. Uh, without a further ado, I will be giving uh, it over to Howard so he can begin his presentation. Hello, Howard. Hello, thank you. And hello to everyone watching and welcome to today's presentation. I'm Howard Kerner and I'm very pleased and honored to be speaking to you today on a subject that is extremely near and dear to my heart and that is human goodness. Now, uh, pre-COVID, of course, when I've given many, many in-person talks, uh, I've always started the same way, no matter what uh, rescuers I was talking about. I always ask the group to raise their hands if they had heard of Hitler, Himmler, Goebbels, of course, and every hand went up. And then I would ask, raise your hand if you've heard of uh, Raoul Wallenberg, Karl Lutz, Aristides de Sousa Mendes, uh, Georg Duckwitz, and virtually no hands went up. And I would always say, well, that's a pity because those four men alone saved 204,000 Jews from the Holocaust, which brings up what I've always considered to be the subtitle of all of my talks, and that is, why don't we know the names of the good? We know all about the evildoers, but not the good. If we don't teach and learn and celebrate goodness, well, we can't be surprised that the shape our world is in. So, next slide. This quote, cor ad cor locator, was from St. Uh, John Henry Newman, a 19th century British priest who actually borrowed it from a uh, church clergyman many hundreds of years before. But uh, Newman meant by this that uh, our hearts, when we pray, unite with God's heart. Uh, I'm going to use the quote in a slightly different way today, perhaps, to say that I'm thinking of it in terms of the hearts of the good Catholic clergy united with the hearts of the good Jewish uh, people in need and created these beautiful stories of the goodness that you're about to hear. But I hope this is more than a history lesson, but rather an inspiration to know that good and evil are always choices, no matter what. But what do you do in a continent like Nazi-occupied Europe where doing good is illegal? That's right. Helping a persecuted person resulted in the murder of you, your entire family, and the person or people you were attempting to help. Uh, and yet people did good anyway. So keep in mind that these priests and nuns were all criminals by choosing goodness when it was against the law. These rescuers all were lawbreakers who acted illegally. Now, I would argue that they were listening to a higher law than the law of the land, but I hope you're going to be as uplifted and inspired as I've been in researching and learning about these uh, inspiring and amazing priests and nuns. Now, since I've just asked, why don't we know the names of the good? I'm going to assume that you probably don't know many of the names of the priests and nuns that I'm about to discuss. But there's one group of helpful nuns that you all have heard about, and here they are. Oh yes, look familiar. Uh, although the story of the nuns in The Sound of Music is mostly fictionalized, the stories that you're about to hear really happened. 
Now the hills may have been alive with the sound of music, but they were also alive with two things, horrendous cruelty and altruistic rescue. And we're about to learn about the rescue. So let's begin our virtual journey, our tour through Europe in Rome with uh, Monsignor Hugh O'Flaherty, an amazing Irish priest. This man, if you can imagine, hid and saved 6,400 people, mostly Jews, uh, but downed allied pilots, political enemies, other persecuted people. He was the arch nemesis of Herbert Kapler, the head Nazi in Rome. You can see him on the right. And uh, Herbert Kapler uh, tried multiple times to kidnap and eventually kill uh, O'Flaherty, but to no avail. Eventually, Kapler uh, had his men print or, or paint a white line down the entrance to St. Peter's Square and said to O'Flaherty, you stay on your side of the line, that's Vatican City, uh, and don't ever cross over into Rome, because if you do that, you're in my territory and I'm going to kill you. Well, of course, uh, Monsignor Hugh O'Flaherty uh, paid no heed to that warning, and every night on schedule, he would sneak out of the back of the Vatican where he was living in a different uh, costume or uh, some kind of um, outfit to get into town and help save those people that he saved. So he impersonated a dustman, a coal shoveler, including rubbing black coal dust on his face, a street cleaner, uh, a taxi driver, a fallen allied airman, a Nazi officer, and a nun. <laughs> well, in uh, 1983, there was a made-for-TV movie called The Scarlet and the Black, and the late, great Gregory Peck played Monsignor Hugh O'Flaherty, and the not late, but still great, Christopher Plummer, the captain in The Sound of Music that we just talked about, uh, he played his arch enemy, Herbert Kapler. And in this little piece of a scene, we'll see how O'Flaherty taunted uh, Kapler uh, in Rome. So at the end of the war, uh, Monsignor O'Flaherty survived. And of course, uh, Herbert Kapler was arrested by the allies and thrown in prison for the rest of his life. He had only one visitor in prison, three guesses, uh, Monsignor Hugh O'Flaherty, who visited him monthly for uh, the whole time he was in prison. And 14 years after being in prison, he asked Monsignor O'Flaherty to baptize him in the Catholic Church. And indeed, of course, Monsignor O'Flaherty did so. So while we're in Rome, uh, let's visit the Ospedale Fata Bene Fratelli. Uh, the hospital named uh, the English translation is uh, Brothers Who Do Good. And it's on Tiber Island in Rome and uh, very close to the Jewish ghetto at the time. And so a lot of Jews uh, searched uh, to, you know, came to the hospital looking for sanctuary. 
And of course, the doctors all provided that, but they wanted to come up with a, a more solid plan to save Jews. So the hospital was run by three doctors, uh, doctors Borromeo, Asicini, and also a Jewish doctor, Dr. Sasser Doty. And uh, Father Bialik installed and ran a radio station down in the basement in which he kept in touch by, uh, with uh, allied uh, fighters and partisan groups and uh, resistance groups. But they all got together one day and said, let's come up with a plan that we can really help Jewish refugees. And so they came up with this amazing idea to create a fictional disease amazing, called Syndrome K, and the K was a humorous dig at Colonel Kapler, who we saw in the last uh, scene. Uh, so they uh, invented the Syndrome K, and every Jew that came looking for shelter at the hospital had his file or her file stamped Syndrome K, and they were put in a separate ward in the hospital, away from the other patients. Now, of course, the Gestapo came often looking for uh, you know, anybody that uh, they wanted to pick up, especially Jews, of course. And so when they would look around the hospital and they would come to this ward, then what would happen, of course, uh, they would say, what's this? Uh, big sign, Syndrome K, do not enter. And they'd say, what's that? And the doctors would say, oh, you don't want to know about syndrome, okay? It's, it's highly disfiguring. It's absolutely terminal. And it's extremely contagious. Well, Dr. Sacerdoti said that the Nazis fled the hospital like rabbits. But their plan was to keep the Jews hidden there until uh, Father Bialik could find another place to hide them, alternative monasteries and other shelters. And uh, then they would stamp the file of the Jew who had been replaced in some other shelter, Morbo decay, died of syndrome K, but it kept the fluid movement, Jews coming in, looking for help, stamp syndrome K, hidden for as long as they needed to be till Father Bialik could find them another place to hide, and then their files stamp Morbo decay. And uh, everyone loved uh, Father Bialik. They said, one of them said, he was my second father, I owe my life to him. Uh, and they ended up saving hundreds and hundreds of Jews. So now we'll take our virtual journey north to Belgium. And Henry Reinders, also known as Father Dom Bruno, this priest saved 400 children in convents and in private homes, including his own and his uh, mother and brother's homes. He helped with ration cards and uh, money and fake identity cards. He also saved downed allied pilots, by the way. He built an underground network uniting with other resistance groups. And of course, some were inevitably killed in the process, but he placed these Jewish children in Catholic boarding schools and escorted each one to the school to make sure uh, that there was no suspicion. He visited often and he gave the children non-Jewish sounding names so they would blend in better. Of course, the Gestapo heard about him and started looking for him. So he very smartly stopped wearing his priest cassock and put on civilian clothes and wore a beret and rode a bicycle and they never caught him. And after the liberation, uh, Dom Bruno reunited the children, all of whom survived with whatever family members had survived. Very amazing. Uh, another helpful priest in Belgium was Father Joseph Andre. He said, the doors of my church will always be open. My home is your home. He hid children in churches and his, and his home, 200 children. Now he learned the names of every single child and wanted to hear about their individual experiences. He was a great listener. He comforted the children because they were very frightened, of course. And he did not let the kids forget their Jewish heritage. In fact, the nuns at his church prepared a complete Passover Seder for the children and said to them, you escaped from slavery in Egypt long ago, but we're all going to be liberated from slave, slavery soon. After the liberation, he brought the Jewish chaplain from the U.S. Army to uh, the church to speak to the children. And he said, he, uh, uh, the uh, priest said to them, you pray to God in your religion, I pray to him in mine, and our prayers converge. 
And when he said goodbye to each of the children, he called them his children, uh, they each gave him a hug and noticed that on his black cassock, instead of having a cross hanging there, he had a Jewish star. An amazing man. So one more stop in Belgium. Uh, let's stop at the Sisters of Très Saint Sauveur, a wonderful uh, convent in which 15 Jewish girls lived at the convent for nine months uh, and uh, under the care of uh, Mother Superior Marie Amelie. And uh, she did a wonderful job of protecting them until that inevitable day when the Gestapo banged on the door and came in and said to uh, Mother Amelie, look, we know you're hiding Jewish children and you know that's against the law. So get them together, we're going to take them with us now. Well, Sister Marie Amelie thought very quickly and said, okay, I understand, right? Uh, except that uh, some of the girls are not here right now. They're off in different places. If you would come back tomorrow morning, I'll have them all together for you and then you can take them all. Well, <laughs> miraculously, the Gestapo agreed. And as soon as they left, uh, Mother Superior Marie Amelie got to work and she started contacting every resistance group, Jewish resistance groups, whomever she could get hold of and told them what was going on. And they said, don't worry, we've got this handled. And at 10 o'clock that night, so 12 hours later, these three Jews dressed as Gestapo barged in, they ripped the phone wire out of the wall and tied the nuns to chairs. And then they gathered the girls together. And of course, the girls were terrified. But one of the uh, Jewish uh, people dressed as Nazis whispered to them in Yiddish. So they realized, OK, this is not what it seems. It's going to be all right. And these resistance fighters dressed as Gestapo took the girls away and 12 hours elapsed. Of course, by then, uh, the resistance fighters had taken the girls far, far away. They were completely safe. Nobody could get to them then. And at 10 o'clock the next morning, right on cue, the real Gestapo returned and were horrified. What is going on here? Why are you tied to a chair? And uh, so, uh, uh, of course, Sister Marie Amelie said, well, don't ask us. You sent your people here last night to take the girls away. We don't know what's going on. And, and the Gestapo said, that's ridiculous. We didn't send anybody last night. And so the nuns said, well, we didn't tie ourselves to a chair. So uh, then the Gestapo said, why didn't you call for help? And uh, Sister Marie Amelie said, hello, there's a, we've just pulled, you know, they pulled the phone wire out to tie us up so we couldn't cry for help. And the Gestapo kept saying, I don't understand this because we were the ones supposed to take them. And she said, I don't know. They were dressed like you. So the children are gone. I can't help you. And the Gestapo left. And they all and the children survived the war. What a clever, clever story. Now let's go east to Poland to father and later saint Maximilian Kolbe. When he was a child, he had a visitation from the Virgin Mary who said to him, I am offering you two crowns, one white and the other red. The white one means that you will persevere in purity, and the red one means that you will become a martyr. Which do you choose? And he chose both. So when he grew up, he began publishing extremely powerful anti-Nazi literature and eventually hid, managed to hid through a network, 2,000 Jews in various safe spaces throughout Poland. And of course, the Nazis caught on, and eventually he was sent to Auschwitz, and here's what happened to him then. Sent to Auschwitz, he became prisoner number 16670. He didn't stop helping others, handing out his pitiful rations and drinks, praying for the dying, and comforting those in need. One day, one of the prisoners from his block escaped. He and the other prisoners were lined up. An SS officer arrived and announced that 10 of them would be starved to death as a punishment. One by one, the 10 were selected from amongst their ranks. The priest was not one of them. One of the men chosen, Franciszek Gajowniczak, cried out 
for his wife and his children. Then the priest made his decision. He stepped forward, walked up to the officer and asked that he give his life in return for that of the man's. The officer chose to accept. The 10 prisoners were led to their cell, stripped naked with no food or water to die a lonely, horrible death. He led the agonized prisoners in prayer and meditation. Two weeks later, he was one of the last remaining. He was finally executed by injection, kneeling in prayer and offering his arm to his murderers. His name was Maximilian Kolber. Yes, uh, real, real goodness is so powerful, as you saw. Uh, the, uh, the man whom he saved is uh, pictured in the upper photo on your right with his family. Of course, uh, his wife did survive the war. His children, sadly, were killed in the war. But in 1971, the saved man was a guest of Pope Paul VI at the Vatican where Maximilian Kolbe was beatified for his martyrdom. In fact, Pope Francis just recently visited the cell that you saw in the picture. Okay, uh, while we're in Poland, let's visit Sister Alfonso in southern Poland in a town called Premish. She wanted desperately to help save Jews but she had signed an affidavit with the Germans that uh, in which she said, I will only save Catholic children, not Jewish children. But she, of course, decided to disregard that. And she uh, saved uh, 10 girls and three boys and had them join with the 34 Catholic children that she was already protecting. Now think of what was involved in rescuing Jewish children by Catholic Poles. First of all, convincing Jewish parents to let go of their children. Can you imagine the altruism uh, that it would take and the trust that it would take to release your child to people you don't know in the hope, and it was only a hope, that these people could keep your child alive during the war, even if you die? Ah, oh, amazing courage. Uh, and they, of course, the children's names had to be changed from Jewish sounding names to Polish names. The names had to be changed and so did their family history had to be changed. Uh, and the, girl, at least, uh, the uh, children had to know their family history. They had to learn to eat different food. They had to learn Catholic prayers and learn them well because when Gestapo would come into the convent and point at a child, the child had to recite uh, a whole number of, of Catholic prayers from memory. It had to be so overlearned that they could simply recite it without a moment's hesitation. The children had to learn to make the sign of the cross. They had to learn Polish because all of them spoke Yiddish which of course was a, a easy giveaway. So they had to attend mass, they had to learn how to behave during mass. And of course, if soldiers came in and pointed to anybody and said, what do you want to be when you grow up? The boys all had to say, I want to become a priest and the girls, I want to become a nun. Well, uh, Sister Alfonso was a rare person who managed to teach the children to keep respecting themselves and, and told them they're good and they, and they remember your family and remember your religion. And, and I'm not trying to make you Catholic. I'm only trying to teach you Catholic prayers so that no one will suspect that you're Jewish. And besides, we all pray to the same God. But of course, think about it from the point of view of children. They were terrified. They were separated from their parents, whom they knew you know, were the only people they knew well, their families. And they were put in charge of these people, uh, put under the charge of these people whom they didn't know. The children screamed and cried and fought and threw their precious food on the floor and wet their beds. But Sister Alfonso was so committed to the comfort of each child that she stayed up, if necessary, all night not sleeping herself, just to care for each and every child. Now, the first Jewish child that was admitted to her care was a four-year-old, you can see her on the right of the screen, Hetty Rosen. 
who was renamed, of course, Jadwiga Rosowska. Now, her mother, Hetty Rosen's mother, left her in front of the convent where Sister Alfonso lived, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and the child was screaming, of course, in terror, being left alone. But of course, the nuns heard the screaming, took the child in, and took care of her and protected her for two years. Now, the mother got a job nearby and took her very pitiful rations and would sometimes deliver them to the convent. But she could never really acknowledge her own daughter because she wanted the nuns to think that this was a Catholic child. And so can you imagine she would deliver the food and just glance at her daughter and then leave? At least she knew her daughter was safe and they all survived the war. Now to get a better idea of what was involved with the nuns and the children they saved, and these are now children that are elderly adults looking back on the experience, here's a little video clip that will illuminate that. przyjemnością w tych, w, tych, w tych obrządkach religijnych uczestniczyłem, no bo one były, one były piękne i wyobrażam sobie, że dlatego do takiego trochę głodnego i trochę obdartego dziecka nagle uczestniczenie w takich pięknych, podniosłych uroczystościach to było coś bardzo pięknego. But for many children it was a difficult, confusing experience. Ja byłem trochę przerażony, bo ja nigdy przedtem w takiej wielkiej grupie nie żyłem. Ja wiedziałem, czym to grozi i ja bardzo siebie yy, yy, kontrolowałem, bo tu ja byłem świadomy, bo strach jest dobrym nauczycielem, że ja nie, nie powiedział jakiegoś głupstwa. I na przykład miałem dużo bogatsze słownictwo od tych dzieciaków, moich kolegów. I jak ja użyłem kiedyś słowa archipelag, bo ja to słowo znałem, to któryś z tych dzieciaków powiedział, ojej, on używa żydowskich słów, to jest Żyd. Więc ja się wtedy zacząłem zastanawiać, jakich słów ja nie powinienem używać. I potem rzeczywiście ja zapomniałem to wszystko. I was baptized and I was converted and uh, became a very, very strong Catholic. I used to, I used to pray very often. We used to go to a mass once a week. And uh, as far as I was concerned, uh, I was going to grow up and be a priest, like all the other boys. I was praying every day for uh, perhaps a little more food and for Jesus to forgive me for the terrible sin that I had been born a Jew. Convents were often inspected by German troops, and the nuns were creative in concealing the presence of Jewish children. Będę traktował inno jak, jak swoje dziecko. Przykre epizody to były, jak się, jak się pojawiał ktoś, ja tego nie rozróżniałem, przed którymi gośćmi mam, mam się chować, przed którymi nie, ale byli tacy, one mi tylko mówiły, że mam się chować, no to biegłem na taki strych i rodzaj takie szafy tam było, to wtedy się chowałem i one mi dawały sygnał, kiedy, kiedy ja mogłem wyjść. Strach był jakimś takim i stałe uciekanie i chowanie się było jakimś takim normalnym elementem życia. As many as 200 Polish convents gave shelter to thousands of Jewish children. All the children placed in convents by Arena Sendler's network survived the war. Irena Sendler, who was just referenced in the video, actually was a 29-year-old Polish social worker, Catholic, who managed with her other co-workers and friends to develop a network which saved 2,500 Jewish children. And all of them survived, you can imagine. And uh, so there were lots of people like that throughout Poland that in those hundreds of convents saved tens of thousands 
of Jews during the Holocaust. But to illustrate back to Sister Alfonso what was at stake, Premish, this town that she was living in, uh, had 20,000 Jews in it in 1939, before the war. After the war, only 250 remained. Uh, but at least the children that she had helped did survive, and so did she. Okay, now we're going uh, west to France, and uh, Father Pierre-Marie Benoit. What a fascinating person. He saved, imagine this, 4,000 Jews. He said, you are Jewish and you must remain Jewish. He called the Jews his protégés, and they called him the father of the Jews. He provided false baptismal certificates. Uh, he found a good printing press and a great forger. Well, if you were going to be a rescuer in Nazi-occupied Europe, you had better find a great forger. Uh, hiding places, money, uh, and worked with Jewish groups and resistance groups to save as many as he could. He talked with every refugee and had the children sit on his lap, but like every rescuer, there were many close calls. One in particular uh, was particularly terrifying. One day, two men knocked on his door and he opened it and they said, uh, Father, uh, we are Jewish refugees and, and we need your help. We've heard that you help Jewish refugees. And uh, Father uh, Benoit said, I'm sorry. Uh, he just, he, he began to feel there was something wrong here. And so he said, uh, uh, I'm sorry, you've been misinformed. I don't help Jews, that's against the law. But these two men persisted, and more and more Father Benoit got the feeling that there's something not right going on here. And they said, look, we know you help Jews, and so all we're asking is for you to help us like you do all the other Jews. But he kept saying, uh, Father Benoit kept saying, I'm sorry, I don't know what you're talking about, and eventually closed the door. Well, that little voice in Father Benoit's head turned out to be absolutely accurate, because later that day, he discovered that those men were in fact Gestapo agents, and had he let them in, they would have no doubt killed him and endangered all of the 4,000 people that he was responsible for hiding. But an even more uh, a frightening close call came that night, or, uh, or near, I think it was a few nights later. He was sleeping at 2 a.m. and uh, was awakened by a friend who said, the Gestapo are coming for you. You must get out of here. So he left the monastery out the back door, down the street to the convent. He shaved that beard, if you can imagine, in about five or 10 minutes and put on a nun's habit. So when the Germans got there, they walked right by him. They didn't recognize him. Ah, cleverness, amazing. Ah, Father Pierre Chaillet, another great French priest. Uh, he was very disturbed that only Protestant and Jewish groups were helping save Jews, and he thought that Catholics ought to get involved. So he wrote a document called Catholic Witness, in which he encouraged Catholics to help save Jews. Uh, and then he created an organization called Amitié Chrétien, Christian Friends, which also was uh, tasked with the idea of saving as many Jews as possible. Now he, Father Chaillet, uh, escorted many children through across the border to Switzerland. He saved well over a hundred children and constantly took care of them and, and kept track of where they were and whatever. Now the Gestapo arrested him and said, you are going to tell us what children you're helping. We know you're doing this. So tell us where these children are and who they are. And when he refused to answer, they put him in a psychiatric hospital for two months. Uh, then in uh, February 43, he was at the offices of Amitié Chrétien with his co-workers. The Gestapo barged in and started beating each of the co-workers. And they said to Father Chaillet, you turn towards the wall, face the wall, which he did. And as they were continuing to beat the co-workers, uh, Father Chaillet realized in his pockets were little slips of paper with notes about children and their real names and their whereabouts. And so while the Gestapo was otherwise occupied with the other uh, workers, he put those pieces of papers in his mouth, he ate them and swallowed them. And the Gestapo beat him, of course, and when they were done beating him, he just went back to his uh, avocation of saving Jews. Such courage, I tell you. 
Uh, so also, uh, one more stop in France, uh, this uh, remarkable nun, Sister Helene Studler. Did you ever see such an innocent face? Not to mention the Wimpole there. Well, she was known as the, the sister with a truck. Can you imagine? She uh, obtained a truck and went around with her little innocent face and a lot of resistance fighters and uh, partisans. And she rescued people from uh, uh, prison camps and other places of enclosure where the guards weren't that you know, weren't that uh, uh, good about keeping track of everybody. And of course, when they saw that face and, you know, the, the fact that she was a nun, nobody suspected that she was grabbing all these people to take them away and save them. She saved with her network 2,000 people in France and rescued them from certain death uh, along with the resistance fighters that she worked with. And among the Frenchmen that she saved was the man who would eventually become the French prime minister who served for the longest time of any prime minister in French history, Francois Mitterrand. And you can see his picture on the bottom right of the slide. Okay, well, we're heading east now to Hungary and Sister Margaret Slachta, who formed a group called the Sisters of Service and uh, they were also known as the Sisters of Grey because they wore gray habits. And she also dressed up many of the Jewish women that she saved in gray habits. And she wrote a lot of articles opposing uh, the anti-Jewish laws put into effect by the Nazis. And she taught her nuns that they were responsible for saving Jews, even at the risk of their own death. Now, one day she was in her classroom teaching her young students when a Gestapo officer came in, got everybody up and lined them against the wall and started interviewing every single student. Where do you come from? Tell me about your family. And finally, Sister Margaret exploded with, do you think that we're raising bulls here that you need to inquire about their pedigree? Our work is saving souls, so get out. And miraculously, he did. And then when a church official complained to Sister Slokta that she was endangering the lives of the other sisters by working so hard to save Jews, she replied, to whom can the Jews turn for merciful compassion, if not the church? We will not hide our faces from the eyes of God, and we will save as many children and others as we can. And of course, she did. 2,000 of them were saved. 2,000 Jews were saved by Margaret Slachta, even though some of the sisters were murdered by the Hungarian Nazis, still 2,000 people survived. Okay, now uh, heading west on our virtual journey, back to Italy, but this time to Assisi. Now, uh, there were no Jews in Assisi before the war, but during the war, lots of Jews came to Assisi for one of two things, either to be protected uh, by uh, being hidden in a convent or monastery, and there were 26 convents and monasteries in Assisi, or to be escorted by the, uh, the clergy to another place in Italy where the Nazis and, and Italian fascists weren't there so they could be safe. Well, uh, the bishop, Bishop Nicolini, decided to uh, nominate uh, Father Aldo Brunacci and Father Rufino Nicacci to run this rescue operation. So the first group was a group of about 20 Jews, uh, and uh, including a rabbi. In fact, the rabbi took out of his bag a Torah scroll that he had managed to save, and he said to the bishop, please hold this during the war and then give it to the Jewish community after the war, which of course the bishop agreed to do. And so they dressed up these Jewish refugees as Catholic pilgrims and Father Nikachi took them to the train station where he was going to shepherd them on to a safer place. Well, they got on the train. Uh, the rabbi was terrified. He just kept reciting the one Catholic prayer that he had learned and everything was great until the Nazis stopped the train and got on and the Gestapo went down the train checking papers, everybody's papers. They had just gotten to these uh, Jewish refugees dressed as Catholic pil uh, pilgrims at, uh, and were about to question Father Nakachi about who these people were when a squadron of British flyers flew overhead and dropped bombs all over the area. Well, the Gestapo ran off the train, drove away, at which caused Father Nakachi to put his hands together and say, 
God bless the British. <laughs> they went on to their destination safely, and he conducted many of these rescue operations, all of which ended safely. Now, back in Assisi, he also came up with a brilliant idea to hide groups of Jews there. At first, he thought he would hide them in a, um, a kind of a, 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 a boarding school or boarding house next to a Catholic uh, convent. But then he said, no, that's too easy for the Germans to find. So he said to Mother Josephina at this convent, we want to hide these Jews, they were standing right near her, in the cloister. Now, the cloister had not admitted a male for 700 years. And of course, Mother Josephina said, I'm sorry, I can't do that. That's not possible. Uh, it's never been allowed, and only the Pope could give me permission to do that. And Bishop Nicolini said, but uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Rufino Nicacci said, but the, the, look, the people are here. The, the Gestapo is coming up the street. If we don't do something this minute, they're all going to be killed. Is that what you want? And Mother Josephina stayed you know, her position and said, I'm sorry, I can't do this. Well, at that lucky moment, Bishop Nicolini arrived and said to Mother Josephina, you must let these refugees in. And she said, I cannot do that. Only the Pope can authorize that. And Bishop Nicolini said, well, I am the Pope's representative in Assisi. And by the way, he told me to tell you to let these people in. And so she said, okay, if the Pope orders it, that's fine. So all of these men and women and children got into the cloister and the door was just closed when the, the Gestapo came into the lobby with their weapons and shouting and all of this. And Mother Josephina leaned against the door that she had just closed to, uh, to keep the, uh, the Jews in the sanctuary there. And she said to the uh, Gestapo, how dare you barge into a convent? We are nuns, we are praying. There is no one in here that you need to be looking for. So get out. And miraculously, they did leave. Well, Father Nakachi uh, was so pleased, and right at that moment, uh, he mentioned to Bishop Nicolini, wow, that was a close call, and how wonderful that the Pope came through at the last minute. And Bishop Nicolini said, with a twinkle in his eye, oh, yeah, well, I'm sure he would have authorized uh, Mother Josephina to let the people in if he'd known about it. So there were always ways to survive. In fact, uh, they had also the best of the uh, CC network had the best forger in all of Europe, Luigi Brizzi, who claimed, and it was true, he could make forged documents that look more original than the originals. Uh, another amazing thing was one of the convents in which Jews were hidden uh, for Yom Kippur, when you're not allowed to eat, for the breakfast at the end of the day, they made an entire kosher meal for the Jews in hiding. And one of the Jews said, Assisi could boast the only convent in the world with a kosher kitchen. Ah, oh, great. So now we head north to Lithuania. And sisters Anna Borkowska and Cecilia Maria Rosak, uh, Borkowska on the left and Rosak on the right, uh, they were in Vilnius, Lithuania, and they heard Jews being shot in the forest and decided that wasn't going to happen under their watch. So Sister Anna took in 17 members of a group called Hashomer Hatzer, which was a youth secular uh, uh, Jewish mo movement, and including included in that group was uh, the famous uh, poet, Isra now Israeli poet, Abba Kovner. And he and the other Jews uh, wore uh, priest's habits or nun's habits and worked in the fields and uh, with the sisters, and they loved the sisters. Uh, they called Sister Anna uh, Ima, meaning mother. And uh, this is the place where Kovner famously declared, Hitler is trying to annihilate all the Jews of Europe. Let us not go like sheep to the slaughter. Let us resist to the last breath. And Sister Anna was so determined to help him that if you can imagine this, she smuggled hand grenades as well as other weapons sewn into her habit into the ghetto to help the people there to plan an escape. And uh, she was determined, even though Abba Kovner said, please, we don't want to endanger you. She said, I must help you, and did. Now, after the war, the Israeli Holocaust Museum, Yad Vashem, issued her an award. And she said to Abba Kovner, why do I deserve this award? And he said, while angels hid their faces from us, 
you or Anna of the Angels. Now, Sister Rosak on the right, uh, she helped in every respect, was wonderfully wa warm and merciful, but very strong and very loving. And she was believed to be the world's oldest nun. Can you imagine? She just died two years ago at the age of 110. And even towards the end, when people would ask her to what she attributed her longevity, she would reply, life is very beautiful, but too short. <laughs> if only we could all adopt that beautiful attitude. <laughs> well, the stories that I've shared are only a very few of the thousands of stories of righteous clergy and others who saved Jews and other persecuted people during the Holocaust. But before we conclude the presentation, I will share with you that uh, it was a year or two ago, I was driving by a local church and I saw on their marquee a simple message that so struck me with its truth and that so encapsulated the vital importance of nurturing, recognizing and nurturing goodness. And this is what it said. A lit candle loses nothing by lighting other candles. And it struck me that just like these magnificent priests and nuns and all the other rescuers, uh, be, who, all of whom were lit candles, we must remember that uh, by doing good, by lighting other candles, we're never diminished. In fact, I believe that we're enhanced by doing good because goodness is a win-win situation. In other words, the, uh, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the giver of goodness is, uh, is helped and the receiver is helped. So, uh, with given that, keep in mind that you don't have to hide 400 Jews in your town uh, or 400 refugees of any kind in your town to be a lit candle. We're all lit candles. There are no small acts of goodness. You know, I often hear people say, well, I can't do anything miraculous. Well, who among us can do anything miraculous? But here's something we can do. We can really love and help our family, biological or otherwise, our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, our community, our pets, and ourselves. We can do that. As a famous quote goes, don't let what you can't do in life get in the way of what you can. And so I exhort you each in his or her own way to practice goodness as much as you can. The world clearly needs all of our goodness. So uh, before we go to uh, questions and answers, I just want to say one more quick thing. Uh, it's very important to me uh, to thank uh, Yara and Ula and Kristen and Fawn and Beth and Sandy and Charles and Amy at the Florida Holocaust Museum for always being so supportive and welcoming to me and my passion project on goodness. And of course, thank you to Susan Nolan for her invaluable help behind the scenes. Thank you too to Father Ronnie and Justine who inspire me to learn about this fascinating subject. Thank you too to Alana Cohn Kennedy at the Seattle Holocaust Center for Humanity for her support. And on a personal level, it's very, very important to me, most important, to thank Diva, Robert, Arthur, Kevin, Kenzie, Linda, Sean, and most especially Bob and Patrick, whose brilliant goodness inspire me every day to be a better person and to do more good in the world. And I hope you have such people in your lives. So, questions. Thank you, Howard. Uh, we have a question from the audience okay. um, regarding Irina Sendler. So uh, they're curious to know if, uh, if any of the children saved by her who were converted to Catholicism stayed Catholic or returned to Judaism a after the war. Ah, very good question, because uh, that was one of the main concerns of the Jewish parents, understandably so, uh, turning their children over. They said, will they be converted? And of course, Serena Sendler said, I can't even guarantee that they'll, uh, we'll get them out of the ghetto alive, let alone will they live, let alone will they be converted. And so some of them were converted, most were not because she specifically told the uh, private families, the Polish families that took in the children and the convents and monasteries, she said, please do not 
you know, uh, convert them. And uh, there really wasn't any pressure. You know, some of them were, as we saw in the video clip, some of them were converted and only later in life even found out that they were Jewish. Uh, but the, the wonderful thing is, no matter what, they were alive, you know, which would not have been the case had they not been let out of the ghetto uh, by uh, their parents and not uh, protected so well by Irena Sendler. So, uh, there, you know, there were some that were converted, most were not, basically. Okay. They well, <laughs> well, that's great. Thank you for, uh, for that answer. So that looks like um, it's a, that's all the time we have for questions. So thank you again so much, Howard, for your presentation. Um, thank you all. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, uh, thank you to everyone who has joined us for this program. Um, if you missed any part of the presentation or would like to view it again with your families, there will be a video recording available on our YouTube and Facebook pages following this program. Uh, we would also like to hear from you and your experience this afternoon. So if you can please take a moment to complete a short survey after this program, there will be a survey link available below at the end. Um, and if you can't see the link, just make sure to refresh your page um, on YouTube. On behalf of the Florida Holocaust Museum, uh, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, and we hope that you will join us again next time.